But we've been going through a chronological Bible called The Story. And so it's an abridged chronological version. So meaning it's a little bit shorter than the whole thing. But we read it as those events were happening at the same time. So this week we read chapter 19. And we were in Zechariah, uh, Ezra, and Haggai, right? So maybe you go, I have no idea. I just read the book and it didn't have the chapter and verse. Um, I went through the chapter and verse. So it's been good being able to see this and understand what God's trying to do and see some of the big pictures in there. And so if you haven't been here, now you're all caught up in that you know, couple of minutes thing that we showed right before we took the fellowship break and then this chapter right here. But, but it's, it's interesting as we look through this because I think the story has paralleled what's going on in our country in a lot of ways, Right. You look and there's this political polarization in the land, which is exactly the same thing that was going on then. There's this resistance to God and his word. There's a departure from his values. There's this encroachment of immorality and worldliness. And there's this lack of spirituality in the, in the country and in leadership and in all kinds of different things. And we've seen how these beliefs and behaviors caused Israel to divide and the destruction that it brought. We've seen, is that going in and out or is it just my head that thinks it's going in and out? It's going in and out. So we might have to go to the straight mic here. But, uh, testing one, two. Let's just fix it now make sure. Um, but it's been good as we've been able to see this because we're seeing the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of God. And what they're trying to do is, is, is follow God, but they fall down. They make some mistakes along the way. Which we can all say, Amen. We've been in, we've been to that. We, we've seen that the the cities be, become leveled. We've seen God come in and allow other people, other countries, to come in and and, um, and destroy them, discipline them ultimately because their lack of obedience to God. And and you know it's always hard um, when they then are taken away and taken into exile, right? And it's always hard on a person when you feel like you're someplace you're not supposed to be. And maybe that's how you feel at church this morning, where you go, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be here. You know, I'm a Raiders fan, and I see all these Broncos jerseys. What's going on? You know, or, or, or just go, just church in general. I haven't been here for a long time. I know I felt that way uh, the first time I came to church. I grew up going to a very um, traditional church, you know, incense and, and tradition and ceremony. And so it was very different for me coming to something like this where I'm like, oh, my gosh, people are saying amen. And this, what's that girl doing? And she seems like she's dancing almost. And, and somebody tried to hug me, and I just met them. And it, it's uncomfortable. And maybe you feel a little out of place. Well, this was so much more than that. They're living in Israel. They're living in Jerusalem. They're taken away 900 plus miles away into a foreign country. And they're having a hard time there. And and there's this this idolatry going on. And the only cure for, for idolatry, the only cure for following false gods away from home is to follow the one true God. And so as a people of God, they'd been in exile. And we've seen that if God's not worshipped, if God's not honored, if God's not obeyed, then uh, exile gets worse and it gets worse and it gets more and more difficult and it tends to last longer and longer. Let me do this. Let me give you a definition of exile. Exile is being forced to live where you don't belong. We're being forced to live where we don't belong. And so exile isn't just this distant historical event for Israel. Exile is a reality faced by the people of God in each and every generation. Because we're forced to live where we weren't created to live. We were created for eternity. We were created for God, but we're living here now. And sometimes it just feels like exile. We're forced to live where we don't belong. And, and if you're like me, sometimes you just want to go home. Have you ever thought about that? Where there's just the, the, those days where all you can sing is, This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Right? Or there's times where I just go, That is the only thing that brings me solace. And I've got to be honest, like lately... That hasn't been the case. I've just been loving life. You know, but I'm loving my kids and loving the the stage that they're at. I'm loving the church. But there are times where you just go, I just wish I could be with God. And we got to balance that. Because when times are going good, we don't want to get prideful and forget God. And when times are bad, we don't want to get desperate and just go, well, forget it. It doesn't work anyways. We've got to balance that, that God really wants us to be there. And you know, maybe someone, you, you've lost someone that you love. You go, I just long to be in heaven with them. 
I long to be someplace different. And I think that's how the people of Israel felt. They longed to be back home in their capital city of Jerusalem, where God said he was going to build his temple and God was going to reside. They're in Babylon, 900 miles away, and they just longed to go home. They just want to go home. And maybe you've already noticed uh, the, 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 this week, the, the title of the chapter was The Return Home, which was good to be able to see that they're finally getting to go. And we're going to be over in Ezra chapter one for a little while. So if you want to turn over to the book of Ezra, we're going to look at this because after decades of isolation and, and uh, deprivation, a light seems to be there at the end of the tunnel. And they're grateful for that. They're going, we are getting this chance to go home. And, and it's cool because in Ezra, it's a, one of those times like we talked about last week where God just said, hey, by the way, you're going to pray. I'm going to fight this battle for you. And he just did it. They just slaughtered each other, the enemies of God. And, and it was just done. And it's interesting. It's very similar here in Ezra chapter 1 as it, as it, as it comes forward here in, in verse one, uh, 2 of chapter 1. It says, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and with livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So this is not one of the kings of Israel. This is not a king of Judah. This is not an Israelite king. This is a a Persian king, pagan king, who goes, I think your God is the real God, and I just decided... I'm sure God wasn't involved at all, right? No, God put it on his heart. He goes, I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide for you the opportunity to go back home. Not only that, I'm going to give you from the temple, from, from the, the coffers of the kingdom, the money, the silver, the gold to be able to do this, the livestock. You know, we saw that on the, on the, on the little video. You know, God tipped, tipped him over and, you know, dumped some of those things out and ta-da! And all these things. But it's an amazing turn of events because God turns the heart of Cyrus towards him to rebuild it. And he moves the king to, to give them their freedom, to give them all the resources they need to do it. And here's what I think is interesting for us personally. When God calls you to do something, he's going to give you all the resources you need to do it. You know what the number one thing I hear why people feel like they can't do something for God? I don't know if I have what it takes. And I go, if God put it on your heart, I think you have what it takes. He's the God who spoke the universe into existence. He could probably help you out with talking to your neighbor, with, with setting up a, a time to have coffee with somebody from work and talking to them about how good God has been in your life. He's given you the resources. He goes, I think God wants me to write a book. He's probably given you those words. He goes, I, I think God wants me to help study the Bible with somebody. God's given you enough knowledge to be able to do that. I think God wants me to serve the church in this way. He's given you those resources. Look at this. There's a pagan king who has nothing to do with God, does not believe in him, and is totally turned around. Because God said, I want you to do this, and I'm going to give you all the resources to be able to do it. So they're equipped to rebuild the temple of God. And that was at the heart of their return home. And they're looking and saying, we're not truly going to be God's people. We're not truly going to be home until we have the temple. So they're back in Jerusalem, but they start to, this, to rebuild the temple. Now, you've got to remember, Jesus is not on the scene yet. That's 500 years later. That's 500 years after this that Jesus comes on the scene. And so, so right here, God's not in the flesh. So with living without the temple, the presence of God wasn't there. They're, not saying, they're, they're feeling like, if we don't have the temple, we don't have God with us, God among us. And so ultimately, they're thinking, if we don't have the temple, where do we go to communicate with God? If we don't have the temple, where do, we, where do we gather for this common purpose to encourage one another and worship God? Without the temple, they're th- feeling like we might as well just still be in exile because there's no point in doing this. And for the Jews, look at this. The temple was a visible reminder that God wants to be with his people. See, they didn't put the temple like out where DIA would be, where you have to make a decision to drive there. 
forever, right? You know, they, they go, no, no, it would be right in the middle of, of the busiest, most compact, closest um, population of all the Israelites, right in the middle of Jerusalem. So that as they walk by, they do whatever they're doing, they go, there's the temple. There's God among us. And it communicates that foundational truth that God wants to be right in the middle of his people. It's not on some mountain. It's not some far away place. It's right there that God wants to be in our neighborhood. That God wants to, to, to be a good neighbor to you. So it's 538 B.C., uh, if, if what, if, if, depending on which history book you look at here. And, but 50,000 Jews are prompted by God. They're freed and funded by King Cyrus of Persia. And they make the 900-mile trek back to Babylon, or from Babylon to Jerusalem. And they went to work. And at first, they're super zealous. They're really excited. They rolled up their sleeve. Their highest priority was, we've got to rebuild this thing. We've got to get it going. We've got to make it happen. They're super excited. It's, uh, it, 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 you see in this, they, they, they go, let's build the altar. Let's do some burnt offerings. Let's get this thing going. We can't wait to finish it. It's like when you're doing a kitchen remodel, you put the stove in there and I have to cook a pizza or something because I just, I, I know nothing else is done, but I want to, want to feel like something's going in the right direction. That's kind of where they're at. And God looks and he goes, I'm pleased with this. Ezra chapter three and verse one, he says, the people assembled together as one, as one, there was unity they were there together. They loved it. It's like the beginning of church with all the kids in here and all the Spanish speakers. We're all together. We're unified as one worshiping God. They began to build the altar of God, to, uh, of the God of Israel, and sacrifice burnt offerings on it. In accordance with what was written in the law of Moses, the man of God, despite their fear. So it wasn't that they didn't have any fear. They just said, in despite of their fear, all the people and all, of all the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. So they looked, all the people are against us. They're not fired up about this. But in spite of that, we're going to continue going on. Now, the Bible goes on to tell us that there was many dissenters. There was people around them saying, you can't do it. You're not good enough. You, you shouldn't do this. They start go- talking to the king saying, these people are rebellious. They've always been rebellious. They're just a, a rebellious people. They try to infiltrate them. They try to discourage them, but they stay on task. They made God's priority their priority, and they move forward with it. But you know what happened after a while? The same thing that happens to us kind of lose motivation a little bit. I don't know if that's ever happened to you where you've lost your focus, where they begin to give a little less attention to the house of God and more attention to their personal projects. Maybe they got tired physically of stacking those bricks. It's got to get old. Maybe they, 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 of mixing it together and the stones and the mortar and it's got to be wearisome. It's got to be tiresome. And perhaps the taunts and the jeers of those who ridiculed their rebuilding efforts. They just got sick of hearing that. They're trying to humiliate them. There, there was threats of violence. We're going to come in. We're going to kill you. We're going to destroy you. And maybe they just thought, you know what? It's easier to, to focus on my own thing over here because nobody cares if I, if I fail at this. I can feel successful in making my little you know, wagon wheels or whatever it is that they're doing. You go, I'll put my energy into that because nobody cares. Nobody's trying to kill me for doing my job. And so we pull back and they pull back. Maybe it's happened to you. You make this big commitment. You go, January 1st, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to read the whole Bible in a year. And if we're all honest, if we've been around for a long, any amount of time, you go, I'm going to do the Bible in a year. And we make it to like January 23rd. You know what? Next year, next year, I'm not going to get behind, right? You know, and, and we just go for it. And I, it's kind of one of the reasons why I'm loving the story because it's given us a high level overview, right? We're seeing that upper story of what God is trying to do. And yet, I go, some of us were even kind of failing at that. It's a chapter a week. It's like five, six, seven pages. Totally can do it. But we're excited. We're going to do it. And it's August. Where's your New Year's resolutions gone? Or perhaps you read a scripture and you're really convicted by it. You're like, I'm going to be super spiritual at work. I'm not going to fudge any numbers about this. I'm going to, I'm going to stick to it. And you're, but then you get pressure from your boss. Like, I know you're not supposed to, but it's okay. You know, fudge it this way a little bit. It'll be fine. Or, or maybe there's more of a more personal motivation where you go, well, 
I know only works 35 minutes, but that's more than 30, which is almost an hour. And so I worked an hour. And we fudge things a little bit. We got convictions, but we, but we don't do it. We're exaggerating. We're, we're fabricating. Or maybe you go to teen camp and you go, it changed my life. It's incredible. I'm so motivated to, to become a Christian or change this or you know, convert every single person on my campus. And then school starts and life happens. And you go, gosh, this is tough. You know what? Next summer, that's when I'll really make the changes I need to make. That's when I'll really do it. Or maybe you're thinking at college this fall, I'm going to be totally different. I'm going to be like super uber spiritual. And then it's the first week of school or first, you know, first couple of weeks and somebody invites you to a party and you go, well, maybe I can, you know, I'll, I'll be a light in a dark place. I'll, I'll go and help. I'll be there for them. And you go, well, I'm just being relatable. I'm just being helpful. I mean, didn't Jesus make wine at a party or something? And I can go and be fine. And we, we get distracted and we just go, Ugh. we give in. We make excuses and we think next semester, Christmas. That's, you know, Jesus' birthday. That's when I'll focus on those kind of things. Or maybe you get motivated to serve the body of Christ, serve the church. You go, I see a need. I'm going to get do this. I'm all excited. And then there's some distraction or there's some dissension where there's somebody who just goes, ah, are you sure? I don't know. And you go, oh, forget it. I'm done. And we give up and, and we go th- for something else. We, we don't want to give it another try. It's easier to focus on work and be fulfilled over there because nobody's telling you what a how you can't do it. You go, I'm good at this. I, I, I don't have to have a learning curve on figuring any of that out. I know how to do this. It does, I don't take it personally when somebody doesn't follow through on what they're doing at work. But man, when it's at, at church, sometimes we do. There's very few heartbreaks as hard as trying to help somebody love God or know God and study the scriptures. And they just go, I don't want that. But you've poured your heart and your life into it. It's easy to lose focus. Because it's discouraging. And so we focus on our car, our career, our house, our sports team. Because it makes us feel happy, if only for a moment. And we don't start out intending to do that, right? None of us go, here's what I'm going to do. I'll be really excited and I'm going to give up three seconds later. None of us do that, right? But, but here's what C.S. Lewis says in, a, in an essay that he wrote during World War II. It's called First and Second Things. And he wrote this. He says, if you put first things first, you get second things thrown in. But if you put second things first, you lose both first and second things. What's he saying? He's saying, make God a priority. What's he saying? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. He's saying, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and and all these things will be added to you as well. And my guess is that these Jews were well-intentioned. They walked 900 miles. That's good intentions, right? I mean, that's a really long way. And they're probably thinking, you know what? We're going to get working on this temple. You know, it's going to be awesome. And something comes up. You go, you know what? Next week, I'm going to work on that thing. And week turns into a month. And a month turns into a few months. And a month and a few months turns into a year. And you go, man, I was really intending to do that. I was really excited to go after this. But, but hey, you know, I got to focus on my crops. Man, when my house gets finished, then I'll be able to focus. This remodel, it's taken forever. You know, these, these new rims, they're just not quite, you know, working out. Or the, the base on my, my stereo, if I could just tweak it or give it a couple more watts, and then we're, we're excited. And, and person by person, they just quit showing up. Not because they're bad people, because they lost focus. So at one day, there's no more burnt sacrifices, and God's kingdom became insignificant. To them and the people looking on it. You know, it's a bit like us. Because I can think through the different excuses that I've made. I thought, man, once the kids are sleeping through the night. Like that was a glorious day when the kids start sleeping through the night. Parents, give me an amen, right? You go, then what's the next big thing? They're out of diapers. Praise the Lord in heaven, right? You know, I don't have to fill the landfill anymore with toxic waste. You know, and you go, they're out of diapers. You know, that's an awesome day. That's a really exciting time. Then I can serve. Or you go, once the kids are in full-time school, then we can get this going and we'll really focus on our marriage and we'll help other people and it'll be great. Maybe, maybe it's once we save up enough, let's just focus on work here. And you and I will work really, really hard. We get enough in the bank. Then 
then we can really give to God. Then we can be a blessing to the church. Or maybe it's, you, you look and you go, for students, you go, you know when I'm really going to get on fire for God? Summer. Summer's when it'll happen. What happens every summer? When semester starts, you know, and, and like you just, it, it's so easy. Or, you, or maybe you think this, you go, if I just had a dating relationship, then I'd be relatable. I wouldn't be weird. And then I could help, you know, people understand God. Or the end all be all. Once I retire, then I'm all Jesus's. And we look at all these different things and, and all these different things and, and it just doesn't work. And that's what happens to the Israelites. A week passes, a month passes, a year passes, two years, five, ten, ultimately 16 years of the stopping of the rebuilding. It turned into this abandoned construction site. And that was time enough for the, for the second things to become first things. And they just start to forget. The weeds grew and they covered the footers of the foundation, not to mention the foundation of their heart and the foundation of their faith. Sixteen years is enough time for the visitors of the surrounding nations to look and go, I guess they don't care that much about their God. I, I, don't, I guess they don't take it that seriously. It was enough time for the whole generation of children to grow up and look at an abandoned project that their parents started with zeal and go, they just stopped. We forget sometimes that our kids don't have some of the same victory stories that we have. They don't have that same faith those five smooth stones of faith like David had of killing the lion and killing the bear and protecting the flock. And we just think, oh, they'll be fine, they'll be fine. And they just look and go, well, you're not building God's temple at all. They don't understand the stories and they didn't see some of that passion because, see, they didn't see that their parents' passion to start the project. They just see the abandoned project. And they thought, this is what serving God looks like. Maybe that's okay. And they miss out on that, that excitement that comes from giving your whole heart to serve God. And when the going gets hard, we give up and stop. And that's not a lesson we want to teach. And I, I don't think they meant to do this. And we don't mean to do this. None of us start out with this point. Barry Cameron wrote this. He says, as God's house lay in ruins from all those years of neglect, their own houses were looking pretty good. They hadn't become notorious sinners they just become self-centered. Gulp. You look at that and go, gosh, how true. But we have to remember the upper story. That God wants to have a relationship with us. He's willing to do whatever it takes to, to live in us and live with us. So God raised up another prophet to call them to repentance around this same time. And God brought this prophet. And maybe you've heard his name before. His name is Haggai. And Haggai spoke to the people about this predicament. And it, it turns out in God's eyes, this predicament wasn't so little. God is, is going, I am super serious about this. So in Haggai chapter 1, the prophet lets the people know what God thinks about their distraction from the temple. What God thinks about their passivity and their inattention to God's agenda to dwell in the middle of his people. God goes, I want to be there right there with you. And you're not following through on something that could help you so much. And so in Haggai chapter one, verses four through nine, this is going to give us a little insight of what's going on and, and, and how they'd been spending their time and money on other things rather than the temple. He says this, he says, is it, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thoughts to your ways. You've planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. Man, this is like a theme week after week of God saying, you're putting yourself into these things, these, these false things. These things you go, how come this isn't giving me what I want? How come this doesn't fulfill me in the way I thought it should? Because God goes... You're not, you're not motivated in the right way from the right heart to serve me. It says you put on clothes, but they're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse that has holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, it blew away. 
Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, will each of you is busy with your own house. That's how God responds to a person who's lost their passion for God and misplaced the priorities about the things of the world versus the things of God. Do you ever wonder what God does when we treat His mission like an option? Because that's what these guys are doing. They're not bad. They're not evil. They just found something better to do or seemingly better. He says pretty clearly, he goes, hey, I brought drought, I brought downturns, I brought difficulties. All of this life was marked by futility. The people planted and they planted a lot, but it didn't come through. And, and, and they had food, but it was never satisfying. They drank, but they were never, um, their, their thirst was never quenched. They put their security system in, but they never felt secure. And that's what happens. In short, life just doesn't seem to work. Our finest efforts seem to just bring about futility and it's frustrating. We don't know what to do. And so for 16 years, they're going around in circles. They're going, man, I'm motivated. I'm doing all these things, but it just doesn't seem to be giving what I, what I want. And they've been giving the wrong impression to their own children. Hey, we love God. We just don't have time for him. We're doing great. We really are. But in their hearts, they really weren't doing great. They weren't doing what God had called them to do and asked them to do. It seems like life for the returned exiles They're back, but it still seems a lot like exile. It seems really miserable. They changed their address, but not their situation. Have you ever done that before? Where you go, here's what's going to fix everything. I'll move. It's funny, in addiction counseling, this is one, a very normal thing for addicts. They'll just go, you know what the problem is? My my group of friends. If I just got, if I lived in a new place and I found a new group of friends, things will be different. And what's funny is no matter where you go, there you are. Like you go with you when you move. And so if you don't change your heart and be changed by God, you're going to continue on. But we think if I live in a nicer neighborhood, the kids go to a nicer school, then everything will be awesome. Not that that's a bad thing, but if the motivation is this is going to fix my life, it won't. Because we've got to make sure that the first place is first and God throws in the seconds. But if we put second place first, we miss out on both. And the people of Israel had to be the people of God before they could experience the freedom of exile. And that rings true even for us today. We need to be the people of God. Now, we don't need to build a temple. And I'm not saying, hey, we're starting a building project, so give more money. I'm not not talking about money at all in this. Okay, so if that's where you're thinking we're going, we're not. Because I think God doesn't need a temple. God doesn't need a building. We don't need to, to be worried about building this temple as much as we do understanding what he means by that. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 48, Stephen says this. He was the first Christian martyr. He says, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. He's saying, this isn't what we're looking for. This isn't what it's going to be. And God doesn't need a temple. God doesn't want a temple. God wants to be among his people. He wants to live in you. He wants to be close to you. And so I think for for the people of God, we don't need a temple building. We need a temple lifestyle where we're building the temple within us and growing in that. He wants us to be about his business, that it's the first priority in our life. It can't be the only priority, but it needs to be a priority. So I think God would still say to us today, build my temple, build my temple. And we've seen this week after week here, that he wants nothing put first before him, that he wants us to live solely for him. That's the call of a disciple of Jesus Christ. It it is. From the beginning till the end. That's what he calls us for. And and I go, that's because we're supposed to be this new temple. Acts 2.38 tells it pretty plainly. Right? It says this. He says, Peter preaching the first message after uh, Jesus rose again, went back up in the Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes on them. Peter preaches, says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Not just to get wet. Not as a sign of an outward, an outward sign of an inward grace. That's nowhere in Scripture. Why are we getting baptized? For the forgiveness of your sins. Why? Because that's what separates us from God. He goes, do that. Come back to me and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit living in you to give you the power to live the holy life. To, to have your conscience softened for, because it's getting so hardened by the world. That it gives us that ability to live as Christ ambassadors. And I go, that's what God wants. And maybe you go, that's a totally different than what my church taught. 
That was totally different than what my church taught. But that's what the Bible teaches. You go, I'm not sure. I'd love to sit down with you and talk about it or connect you with one of our guest ambassadors to, to be able to teach you what the scriptures say. Talk about that together. You don't have to have any Bible knowledge to, to start. People always think, well, I need to study the Bible so I can study the Bible. You don't know. You don't need you can you can sit down and start learning what God's word says. That's how all of us figured out what God was talking about, because we want to be people that believe in God. That's what that's what Peter says. Look at what Paul says. He says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, that God's spirit lives in you? Because we're the temple of God. And God says to you, would you build my temple? Would you build my temple? These baptized believers in Jesus, we're the house of the Spirit of God. And the cynic says, awesome, then I don't have to go to church. I can stay home and watch football. I appreciate the football lovers who have a game this morning that are here, right? I do. I really appreciate it. And we'll be in, done in time to have you go watch the, the Broncos game. And, and, but, but I also go, the Bible goes on to say, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am amongst them. Why? Because God wants us to be together that we assemble together so that we can, can get our spiritual batteries recharged, that we can help each other, that we can serve each other, that we can meet each other's needs. Because, man, we need help. We need to come in so that our light can burn more brightly, that we can assemble together for inspiration, for fellowship, for accountability, for communion, for teaching, for opportunity to worship together, to give, to help, to sing, to praise, for biblical instruction. And I go, what? The body is its very best when we're meeting as one, when we're unified together and each of us needs each other. Why? Because the world is rough. It's rough. It's difficult. The church is here to help. And it's been so amazing to see the church help. I go in, in the year that we've been here, it, it, in some ways it goes, man, that went really fast. In other ways, it's like, wow, how has it been a year it, it, it's just, it's hard. I go, man, we've seen 22 people baptized. We've seen the church membership go from around 200 to two, uh, in, the, in the north here to over 250. I go, in here, uh, Sunday, when we, this morning, when we had everybody in here at the beginning, people are like, I can't find a seat. I go, that's awesome. <laughs> right? Give it a second. The kids are going to go down. You'll find a seat. Get a little closer. And you go, but I don't want to touch somebody. I know, but somebody's going to hug you anyways. I'm sorry. <laughs> um... But I go, why? Why? Because God's building his temple. Yeah. Right? I go, man, when, when we're healthy, we do healthy things. And when we're closer to God, we do, we're, we're, it just helps so much because God blesses it. When we're doing it, because I just go, think about the people who's not just their lives are changed by God, but their family trees are being changed by God. Because I go, you change, you're going to change your kids, and you're gonna, their kids are going to change. And they, I go, man, that gets the gift that keeps on giving. And we get to decide, are we going to give the gift of dysfunction that keeps on giving or spirituality that keeps on giving? Let, let's go for spirituality. But I'm just so encouraged the way that God is doing it. And God wants to go build my temple. I go, what, what's the next thing going to look like? It's interesting as we read because the older um, Israelites saw the temple. And the young, um, the young Israelites who had never seen the temple before, they're worshiping, they're fired up, they're having a party going, this is incredible! And it says the older Israelites cried because they knew what the former glory of the temple was. They remembered what it looked like before. And see, the young ones are just fired up that this is better than what we had. And see, old, us older ones, we can be inspired by that or we can kind of destroy people's faith by looking and going, well, it could have been better. Well, it can be, and it always can be, because God, man, we're not in heaven yet. It's the only time it's going to be as best as it can be is when we're there. But you just look and go, God fulfilled his purpose then, and God wants to fulfill his purpose now. Because God created something that only you can do. God created a part of the temple that only you can build. And he wants you to build that temple. And if you ever wonder why you feel unfulfilled or frustrated, or angry, or just sad with where your life is at. I think sometimes it's because we're not building the temple that God has called us to build. And the cool part, what did Jesus say? He says, hey, destroy this temple, and I'll re rebuild it in three days. And they go, you can't do that. It's going to be forever. And God goes, hey, if you just come to me, I'll do all the building. 
I'll do, all the, I'll, do, I'll do all the heavy lifting. I'll move all the stones. I just need you to be participating. And so it's not this heavy labor. It's doing what God created you to do. And you know what's cool? When we do what God created us to do, it's kind of fun. It says, for we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to focus on other things. But see, the church needs you. The body of Christ needs you to do those good things that only you can do. And we've had some amazing brothers serve as deacons. And uh, we're, we're letting them retire it gracefully because it was supposed to be for a two-year plan. I think it's been like eight. And some of them going, I'm tapping out. I've done wait. I just can't do it anymore. And some go, I'm still there, but I'd love to just resign, but I don't want to be fired or feel like I'm letting people down. And so we're given an opportunity to, to let everybody who was a deacon go, I, I'd, I'd like a break. Some of those are going to go, man, I'm signing up again. I, I'd love to continue to do that, which is awesome. Or maybe some of you go, I, I'd love to know what, what, what the, what's that, what that's all about. <laughs> that was the worst tongue tied I've ever been in a long time. Uh, but, but maybe you go, I want to know what it's all about. I want to be there. I want to understand it. And maybe some of you go, I, I don't want to be a deacon. I don't like the title. That title's freak me out. Well, we want to have like a whole other group of kind of servants. You know, in the, in the scriptures, you look at Barnabas and Phoebe and Aquila and Priscilla. They served the church, but they didn't really have a deacon title. Maybe you go, I, I want to do that. I want to serve and have a, you know, a role, but just I, I'm tapping out of the title piece. And that's okay, too. We've got tons of options and ways to meet those and, and encourage you to do that. On the website, if you go to denverchurchofchrist.org, go to locations, or if you want to type it in, that works too. There's, there's a big uh, tree there of different opportunities to serve because we really need some help. We need some help with audiovisual stuff as a category. Really need somebody who's a little bit technically savvy with just doing very simple video editing and uploading. Love to have somebody help with that. Servant evangelism, Bible studies, getting new members connected, got a bunch of those greeters at the at, at, at church here or the building you know the building interior the, this is not the temple but it's nice if it doesn't look like the junkyard right you know and so it, it helps to be able to do that where the temple lives in us but but let's do that you know Stuart is working his tail off Dennis Haney's done so much over the years Marty Prinzler but it's hard when it's by yourself and we'd love to have a team be able to do that love to have our online presence I'd really love a Facebooker if you're on there all day, all, every day anyways, I'd love your help with just kind of doing some updates and making sure events are posted and, and, and clear in there. When, and if you go, I don't know how to do it, but I'd love to, we can get somebody to show you how to do that. Kids Kingdom, helping out with the kiddos. They're awesome being able to do that. Or, and then one of the biggest ones is mentoring. Mentoring with our youth ministry. And Kevin McBride's going to come up here in a second. Or right now. Come on up, Kevin. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about mentoring. And... Um, because I think mentoring is super important. I think it's one of the things that I look at, I go, this has changed my life. As I think through the different men that I've had in my life to, to sit with me, to talk with me, to be there with me, that I go, man, it, it's been the thing that's changed me in incredible ways, um, in all kinds of different deals. And I think you actually need to use this microphone because I told them you were going to use this microphone. So I should do what I... I have the technology... To break it, you want to kill that because I unplugged it so it doesn't do something else bad? There you go. Should have let you do that yourself. But um, it's awesome because I go, we, we really want to help mentors and help people get connected. And so I wanted to have Kevin share a little bit about what mentoring has been for him and what we're trying to do as a church. So right. take it away, bro. Awesome. Thanks, Hans. Well, I'm really excited about talk about our mentoring program. If you're wondering what a mentor is, a mentor is just a big brother or a big sister for one of our teens, or even for those of our children that are younger than that. And so why I'm excited about mentors is that I think about my life when I was in high school. Maybe you can relate to your life when you were in high school, and many of us can probably agree that we would have wanted a mentor. We would have wanted just someone to be there to listen to us. And I think about when I was in high school, a lot of the times, whether it was poor decisions, or the nights where I was really lonely, the times where I didn't feel like I really had a true friend or or some of the sin that I, got into, that I got into that had a rippling effect throughout my life in the college, even to now. The regrets that I have, if I would have just had somebody to be there, hmm. just somebody to talk to, somebody that wasn't my mom, 
And for me, actually, I didn't have my dad in my life. And so even more so, I needed someone, especially an older male figure, not too much older, but if they're older, it would have helped a lot. Somebody that could just listen to me. Yeah. Let me know, hey, that's a bad idea. Or let me know, hey, I am your friend. Regardless of what you wear, regardless of, of what you think or how you look or whether you make varsity for football, like, that I still had a friend. And, and I think back to those times and how much I would have needed a mentor. And I didn't grow up in the church. And I think how much more is it true that we wouldn't want to let our own kids go without a mentor now. And I think about when I did become a Christian, how mentoring, having someone, like I said, just a big brother to help me and show me the way, has had a huge impact on me after becoming a Christian. I think about a man like Brian Campbell being in my life and training me and, and correcting me, but also loving me and helping me, and how that's trained me and be ready to do what I'm doing today and to finish college and to be starting grad school now and to be able to be a life that's so much different than the path that I was headed for when I was in high school. So the truth is, mentoring had a big impact on my life, and it will and can have a big impact on all of our teens' lives here in the church. And, you know, on behalf of the elders, the evangelists, and, you know, the teen leadership, it's become clear that right now there's a serious need for mentor relationships with our teens. Every day, if you think about it, they're under an attack from Satan. He's on the prowl, and he wants to take them out when they're young. He wants to take them out so it can have an effect throughout the rest of their lives so that they won't have a chance to preach the good news to other people. So, the reality is, we have a choice. A choice to stand up and to fight back. But I know that we'll be so much stronger in this fight if we choose to, to fight together. Both the parents, campus students, single professionals, young marrieds, older marrieds, whoever you are, a chance to fight back if we're together in this effort. Now, counts as a few questions. So, I, I do think that mentoring is, is super crucial. I think through different things as growing up, of not having the same as well. So we're really trying to get every teen in the church connected with a mentor. And so can anybody who wants to be a mentor be a mentor? Or what's Great the... question. Thanks, Hans. So <laughs> if you want to be a mentor, um, really it's super simple. You know, we do care a lot about the safety of our teens. So we do ask that we're, we're asking only for those who are baptized disciples for a minimum of two years. We've also been a part of our Denver Fellowship here for at least six months. Just for the safety feature there. We know that that's important. And secondly, the requirement, you know, is really simple. All you need to do is meet at least twice a month for about two to three hours. So one and a half hours each time. And that's it. And, and at the bulk of it is really just to build a relationship with them, to be their friend. And being a friend is simple. It means having fun with them, going out, you know, on hikes, prayer walks. Uh, you can get a manicure with them. Guys, you probably don't want to get a manicure. Petty. Oh, I hear it's oh, pedicure, petty, okay. Petty, it's like petty. a foot massage. It's okay. It's still manly. But also, we want to do spiritual stuff with them, too. Things that are going to help foster, you know, at a time when they're really forming their true faith, like real faith with God. We want to help them, whether it's prayer walks, whether it's showing them how to have a quiet time, whether it's talking about things you're learning or the experiences you've had, as you've helped someone become a Christian, and, and really at the end, just to be a safe place for them to be able to talk to you about what's going on in their lives. So as you're looking at that, do you, uh, do you think it has to be, okay, this person has to get with this one? And, you know, how are we going to help organize that? Because they go, there's some, you go, hey, I really like her, and she's younger, and she's cool, and she's hip, and so 14 girls flock around that one. Mm. So how are we going to help so that, that you know, kind of spread the wealth and spl- spread the knowledge? Because they go, you know, that every part doing its work, because I, I think um, there is so much wealth of knowledge in the church rather than having just a few do so much. I think that, that's an unhealthy model that we're trying to, to spread that knowledge and spread that wealth out and spread that knowledge and, and uh, workload as well. Right. Yeah, for us, I know uh, Brittany and myself here in the North, we want to be able to help organize and set up these mentoring relationships. But at the end of the day, it's going to take the heart of everyone here and it's going to take a team effort, like I mentioned earlier, and for us to all serve in order to help these teens get their needs met. And for each and every one of our teams, our goal is for each and every one of our teens to have a mentoring relationship. Okay. That's awesome. So is this going to take, like, the place of parenting? So kids get to say, ah. I, I get to listen. My mentor said, so I don't have to listen to mom and dad? Uh, I don't think so. Probably not. For sure not. Right? Yes. 
That is not the case. Mentors will not take the place of the parents' responsibility. Because yeah. it, it should work together in the same thing with every, everything at church. That we're, we're there to support and we're there to help in the same way as we've got you know, teen ministers that are there to help and support. But they're not taking the place of parents. Because, man, it's, it's, as a parent, it's our responsibility 100%. Now, the church wants to provide great things to help. And it helps a lot to hear it from a different voice. Because I don't know if you've ever had this situation, but you can tell something to your teen, I don't know, maybe a thousand times. And then somebody else comes in, maybe her name is Brittany, um, maybe she gets with your daughter once in a while, and she'll say the exact same thing that you feel like you've said till you're blue in the face, and it's heard for the very first time in all of humanity. And, and, and she comes in and she says, you won't believe how smart, wise Brittany is. It'll be word for word, but a different voice. So I... I tease, but I go, that's a huge support. I don't look at that as a bad thing. I go, amen. My daughter heard what I was hoping for her to hear because I want her to make it to heaven. Amen. My son heard that and respects somebody else and has a hero in the church rather than a hero in rap music or in sports. Because I go, you can be a great example in all of that. So um, I'm super excited for this to start. So, so again, not very much time commitment. You don't have to be a biblical scholar. You're just willing to spend some time in there, have a heart to, to serve, a heart to be a support to the parents. And, and I think commitment is pretty important, though. Like we go, I'm signing up to do this, and we're asking for how, many, how long of a commitment are we asking for from these mentors? Uh, this is for at least for the next year. So one year. One year. So you go, we don't want to do it for a month and give up. But we also aren't committing until they graduate college. That's right. So, and that's helpful, right? Because maybe you... Maybe you like the kid, or maybe you go, I don't like my mentor, but hey, we're going to give it a shot for a year. You could do anything for a year. I mean, it's like having a bad teacher, you know, or a bad minister. I've only been here for a year. Maybe you don't like me. But, uh, but, but I think those things are going to be so great for us to work together, for us to be able to help. Um, and it is super important. And, and um, I appreciate you guys' heart to help make this happen. And so we're trying to do this pretty quick. And so next week, you're going to have a meeting for anybody who wants to be a mentor, and there's something they're supposed to fill out, right? That's right. If you guys, you know, like we say, if you're willing to be a friend where a friend's really needed, then we have a sign-up sheets that you'll find near your seats. If you can fill those out and hand those in after service uh, to either Britt or myself, then we'll follow up with you guys. We will have a meeting next Sunday for, at least just for the guys that are here, a training session on how to be a mentor. It's really simple. Um, but if you can sign up, please, today and, and give us the half sheets afterwards, we'll get you guys started and contact you about getting you started with a mentor relationship. And you guys are going to be right down front after service? We'll be right down front. So he's tall. You can see him. So thanks so much, man. But I, I'm excited for us to be able to do that and get that rolling because I, I, just, I just think maybe you're looking going, I, I want to help. I don't know what to do. Well, that's a great way to be able to do that. Or if you... If you don't want to fill out the paper form or you forgot the paper form or you can't find a paper form, you can fill out it online. Just click mentoring there and Kevin or Britt will get a hold of you to be able to do that. And maybe you're the one who, who just looks and goes, man, I want to get connected. I'd love to have a mentor. For the adults, we have what we call discipling. And it's just a great opportunity to get together to talk about life and get some help. So that's my cell phone number right there, right there. Um, if you want to, you want to get a hold of me or we can get you connected with one of our small group leaders, because ultimately we all have a passion to do something. Or maybe you go, it's been a long time since I had a passion to do something. I think one of the greatest thing to get that passion going is getting somebody in your life who can speak life into you to say, you know what? God has created in you an amazing thing. Cause I know for me, I often have a hard time seeing the good in me. Other people can see it, but man, I, I, I have no problem seeing all the faults and all the negativity. So it helps having godly men and women in my life to talk and, and help and be able to do that. So you have a great opportunity to help the next generation. Because I always say, go, the, the, our kids are not the future of the church. They are the church. And we've got to make sure that we're growing that and helping that and building our temple in each, of, in each other and each one of us. Not just building the, 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 the church building. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I'm so grateful for the amazing church that you have built. God, it's not us, it's not our power, it's not our good things that we've done. It's, it's you. And you have moved and you have brought this, these people together. 
And God, I pray that right now that You're putting on the hearts of the people. That You're putting on our hearts, God, how we can serve. How we can build the temple in our own hearts and build the temple in other people's lives. God, I really believe that the the truest form of church is a few people getting together, looking at Scriptures, and helping us understand what You desire from us. God, we're, we're just Your servants. There's nothing special about us other than that we've been saved by You. And God, I pray that You would help us to take the good things that You've given us, the good things that You've put on our hearts, and use them for Your glory and the glory of, of Jesus. It's in His holy name we pray. Amen.